If you look at effective corporate tax rates uh, you know, over time, they've gone down for, for decades and decades. And so that's helped stock prices as a percentage of GDP keep going up and up and up. And if that starts to level out or even reverse as, as people are trying to find out the, you know, figure out the budget shortfalls and things like that, that can start putting downward pressure on, on equity indices uh, at a time when bonds also aren't performing very well. Uh, and if you've, if you've gotten to super low interest rates and everyone kind of piled into the housing market, then housing prices aren't going up anymore. And you start to get that stagnation. And that's when you start to, it gets kind of messier. That's when you could see, for example, the foreign sector, uh, uh, instead of kind of reinvest their dollars into the US market, they could potentially go elsewhere and kind of start that spiral going in the other direction. We have a returning guest who is well followed in this space. Lynn Alden is the founder of LynnAlden.com, where she is the analyst who gives lots of insights into things ranging from the petro market to the stock market to the metals markets to the bond market to the official actions by our financial handlers. Our viewers are often clamoring to get you back on because the level of insight and analysis that you bring is remarkable. Uh, people gain so much, I do. We learn a lot from your assessment of things. And we have a lot of questions that have been submitted by our viewers ahead of your arrival. That's not surprising. But I wanted at first, because of the timing of this, which we're joining, if you could give us your takeaways from the Jackson Hole Summit that happened just last week, meeting of uh, central bankers from all over the world, influential people that are determining uh, what's coming next in our financial lives. And can you tell us about things that we heard that maybe were surprising, things that we expected, things maybe that we are not likely to hear, even though they may be real, kind of uh, what, what, your, what your main takeaways are from that uh, meeting last week? So I would say we got the good cop, bad cop routine where a bunch of Fed officials told us one thing and then the chairman Powell uh, came out and told us somewhat of a different story. Uh, and so if we back up a little bit, uh, you know, inflation is running above their long term target, uh, which they were aiming for, but it's, it's been higher and longer uh, than they were forecasting uh, officially. Um, and, you know, they're still doing one hundred twenty billion dollars a month in asset purchases. They're holding rates at zero. Um, and so they're starting to get more pressure. Uh, to, to start tapering those rates of asset purchases. Um, and so leading up to this event, we started to see some signs that they would begin to uh, slow down their rate of asset purchases uh, with a plan to eventually stop. And you know some of the, some of the uh, things they were doing, for example, where they were setting up those, those standing repo facilities, um, even though there's currently no demand for repo, it's all, all the demand is for reverse repos, but they were still setting up these repo issues to avoid some of the issues they ran into in 2019 in 2020, or basically to have those in place to absorb them when they happen. Um, we also have a, they also set up like an international repo facility essentially. And then also we, they started kind of, you know, changing the narrative. So they started to talk about the possibility of taper. They started to, uh, you know, kind of lay that foundation so that there's no surprises. Um, and I think they, you know, they started to see that economic growth is somewhat decelerating now. So it's, it's still positive for most categories, but it's decelerating. Uh, they also have ongoing issues with, say, the Delta variant. Uh, they had to, you know, they were going to do their Jackson Hole event in person. Instead, they did it virtual. Um, and so they started to kind of walk back their, their words a little bit leading up to the, to the uh, conference. And then during, you know, during the, the early parts of it, we started to get multiple Fed officials talking about specific tapering plans. Uh, some of them were saying they want to have asset purchase, uh, you know, tapers be finished by the first half of 2022. Uh, these pretty specific calls, so they would be more on the hawkish side, or the, or the bad cop, you could say, as far as markets are concerned. Uh, but then Powell came out and kind of, you know, spent a lot of time not really saying much, uh, which leans dovish. Basically, he didn't commit to any sort of specific taper. I thought that was the job description of the Fed chair was to do exactly what you just said. It's been going on since Greenspan and maybe before. A large part of it is narrative uh, control, yes. So basically, you know, the, the other people kind of set the, you know, the, the tone. And then he came out and said, you know, there's still a lot of variables to monitor. Uh, we're going to be data dependent. Uh, there's still, you know, high unemployment among certain demographics. Uh, there's still so, and then he talked about, you know, he kind of was specific that they don't plan on raising rates pretty much anytime soon until you're at max employment. Um, and then he's still, you know, he's leaning towards asset price uh, purchases to slow down at some point. Still no firm date. We might get a date for that maybe in late September. 
that would give them more time to see what's happening with, say, the, the Delta variant or or economic deceleration. They'll get another jobs report in there. Uh, and so he leans somewhat dovish. And that so my base case going into that was that that was what we would see. And so we started to get those signs that they would taper. Uh, but I was leaning towards that they probably would announce a specific tapering plan. And and so far that's what we got. So it kind of leaned ever so slightly more dovish than market expectations, which were already, you know, kind of obviously pretty dovish. I guess if I could follow on with that theme that you just laid out there, this has been a central point of divergence between different analysts that we've spoken with is whether in fact we are in, uh, in you know, real inflation and it's just going to keep on going on because it's 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 going to just start building momentum and it's been evident to ordinary people but it's still been denied officially except recently by powers that be who say that it's transitory or maybe it's not so transitory and so on versus uh disinflation or deflation if in fact the economy is whatever was whatever was happening of you want to call it a recovery basically a rebound from the lockdowns globally through the through the whole last year is now like still recovering uh excuse me resuming the uh, displaying the weakness that was already present in the economy prior to the end of 2019. so could you tell us your personal viewpoint on this big picture of inflation or not whether it's transitory or whether it's going to stick around and whether in fact the economy is in fact never really gotten back off of its knees and is and is demonstrating that weakness and is that going to affect the inflation answer or can you end up with stagflation where the economy really isn't going to be growing but we're still going to be having price inflation because of all all the uh, currency creation your view on inflation yeah, you can certainly end up with both. Uh, you know, stagflation is possible. My overall base case is that the 2020s decade is going to be more inflationary uh, than the 2010s decade, um, and then the the degree to that will depend on a variety of factors like what kind of fiscal stimulus they do uh, and what some of these other variables are as it relates to say energy prices and things like that. So I think what complicates the discussion is that we do have some transitory inflation variables that are overlaid on a more structural story. Uh, and so when you have those two on top of each other, there's always points that different analysts can point to and say, look, that, that thing's transitory. And someone can say, no, no, that's structural. And, and so, you know, you can have that ongoing debate. So we saw, for example, you know, lumber had a very specific price spike and then it, it gave up a very large portion of those gains uh, because that in some ways was a, a, a transitory issue. We could see another spike potentially. Uh, but, but, you know, for example, there wasn't any sort of shortage in timber. But there was a limitation in sawmill capacity at a time when there was a big consumer uh, demand shift towards suburban and rural real estate and, and more, you know, lower mortgage rates, so you know, more homes. Uh, and so that was a, a specific supply uh, constraint. We also have a deeper supply constraint issue in semiconductors uh, globally, which are pushing up uh, used car prices, uh, causing new cars to be delayed. Toyota just announced a 40% production cut, for example, um, and so that would be an example of kind of a stagflationary variable where you're both cutting production uh, but also use, use car prices are elevated. Now, there are some signs that used car prices might have be you know, somewhat peaking out here, um, kind of like lumber did, that they might have hit kind of that crescendo. It remains to be seen. But then I think the thing to watch later this fall is that rent prices are, are kind of starting an up cycle, um, and so – uh, you know, that part I don't think has fully been factored in yet. And, you know, for longer term, what it really comes down to is whether or not wages will start a spiral upwards. Uh, and so this past couple decades, a uh, few decades actually, has been characterized by a decoupling of labor productivity from wages uh, because, you know, there's been globalization, offshoring technology. And so you got to you got a continued rise in worker productivity, but wages decoupled to the downside. And so that's kept somewhat of a lid on inflation because you could hire someone in Mexico or China to do similar labor uh, for a fraction of the cost. Um, but you know, so we've actually exported the United States more so than than say Europe or Japan, other developed countries. We've exported a large portion of our supply chains, um, and just now we're starting to realize that maybe that wasn't you know the, the the best thing to do. Obviously, some degree of global trade is important, but there can be such a thing as too much. You know, so right now, for example. Global trade is 60% of global GDP, which is a very high ratio. And so, when when a car is being built, you know there might be 30 different countries contributing parts to that car. And if there's like six parts missing out of a you know a thousand parts, that car gets delayed. 
Uh, and so we're seeing that that uh, work out now in terms of uh, global supply chain issues. And so if we start more of a process towards at least partial reshoring, so we bring back some more strategic industries back home, uh, and then there's more kind of political demand to, to work on the trade deficit, um, you know, so we could start to see wages finally, uh, you know, in some ways kind of catch back up, uh, have more bargaining power. We're going to see how that plays out. But if if you get that kind of more persistent wage increases, uh, then that does translate into more inflation. Another thing to keep in mind is the commodity cycle. Um, and so the past decade has been in a period of commodity oversupply. Uh, so we had commodity abundance, pretty low prices. Um, but as we go forward, some of those commodities like copper and even oil to some extent are more constrained on the supply side uh, because we've not put a lot of new investment into them. Uh, and so when we look out deeper to the 2020s, I think we could have a, a situation that looks more like more like the 2000s than the 2010s in terms of, of commodities doing, say, fairly well. Uh, and so when you, when you add a couple of those variables together, if they materialize that way, I think you could see inflation become more persistent. And it just it won't be a straight line and it won't always be the same things going up. It's whatever is constrained at that time, along with a general price level going up because of monetary inflation that's happening. There's so many aspects of what you just went through, uh, as is as is common when you when you cover things. Uh, one thing that is pronounced there is this idea of uh, complex global supply chains leading to that complexity leading to fragility in, a, in it, this just-in-time world where everything has to work like clockwork or things can go quite badly. Uh, Stephen uh, St. Angelo from the SRS Rocco Report is uh, coming on in a couple weeks and he's he's going to recircle re back with us on that particular theme of how vulnerable individual countries or industries ha have left themselves by trying to optimize to the nth degree for low cost as their primary driver and not as robustness. Um, resilience of the supply chain. Um, it's uh, there's there's a lot to be played out, and that what that can lead to is this kind of like when you're in uh, bumper to bumper traffic, you can end up with these these lurching, uh, volatile uh, spit, fits and starts, and uh, that's we've been also told by many analysts is expect more volatility going forward because of that no flexibility in the in the system a lot. Um, okay. Uh, another big theme that we've talked about with you in the past, but we want to touch again again is this idea of currency proliferation, debasement of currencies, and how that plays out uh, maybe geopolitically in terms of the world reserve currency. We have a question from a viewer. Ted Park says, thanks for your interviews, Lynn. How much time do we have left, which is, I know that's difficult, before the difficulties with the U.S. dollar become evident to almost everyone? Do you think that the stimulus bill will accelerate the decline of the U.S. dollar, or is the current rate of monetary expansion so great that it won't make an appreciable difference? Uh, I mean, there's a couple of moving parts there. So one thing that we're seeing around the developed world uh, is that while, say, emerging markets are actually, you know, some of their central banks are tightening their policy because they have they have less, say, fiscal space. They have, you know, their currencies are more prone to devaluation. And so they're actually more more prone to raise rates in this environment and try to protect their currencies. Whereas what we're seeing with developed market currencies is that they're holding rates at zero while inflation is generally positive, especially in, in the United States and, and Germany and some of these other countries. And so you get these negative real rates. Um, and so that's especially an issue for, say, the United States because we have a large portion of our of our treasury bonds held by the foreign sector, and they've been a lot less in, in, inclined to to accumulate those treasuries over the past, say, seven or eight years uh, than they used to, uh, which makes sense because, you know, when you have negative uh, real yields, those are a lot less attractive to hold. They'd rather hold things like gold. Uh, you have you have uh, Swiss National Bank buying stocks. Uh, you know, you have you have countries diversifying their currency exposures to some extent. And so my my longer term base case is that we're, we're shifting more towards decentralized reserves or regional reserve currencies rather than like one of reserve currency. And so basically what we're seeing is that there's kind of two factors there. So one is, you know, from 1974 all the way up to, you know, say 2008 or so, uh, oil could pretty much only be purchased worldwide in dollars. Uh, and so every country in the world that needs to import oil needs dollars. Uh, but ever since, you know, uh, a few years ago, we started to see Russia price oil in euros. Uh, we've, we've also seen China kind of pushing forward to buy some commodities in their own currency. Um, and so far, it's, it's Russia's that took off of quicker. They've, they've been better able to do that. Uh, but basically what we're seeing is a little bit more decentralization in what kind of currencies you can use to buy 
oil and other commodities. And then we've also been in this kind of 20-year trend of, you know, that the United States dollar used to be a higher ratio of global reserves. Uh, it peaked around the year 2000 or so uh, with the, you know, as the euro came about, we started to get a little bit less. And then as we've gone forward, we just have a little bit more diversification in reserves. So the dollar is still the biggest component, but it's a smaller share than it used to be. And I think that's the general direction we're going in, right? So Russia, for example, is de-dollarized. They're holding more euro-denominated assets. They're holding gold, uh, which makes sense because that's a big trading partner for them. Uh, and so we, we, I think we're seeing over time there's that more that shift. I, I think what, what maybe could accelerate it, uh, if it were to accelerate, would be the realization that in, inflation is not as transient as, as uh, you know some have, have been led to believe. And so right now they're saying, okay, supply chain issues. Uh, you know, w you know, this will be gone soon. Um, but I think, you know, if you see, say, rent inflation later this year, early next year, and then let's say there's another round of fiscal stimulus when there's a the next slowdown, uh, that's when I think they'll, they'll kind of wake up and say, okay, this is actually not going to end. This is not a one-time thing. Uh, but it's, it's just, it's not one of the things that goes in a straight line. And as far as, you know, so as far as fiscal spending, you know, the, the argument for kind of a near term, maybe peak in inflation that it might kind of top out and, and go sideways for a while and then maybe even turn down for a little bit is, for example, that there was a lot of fiscal spending back in, in 2020. There was fiscal spending in early 2021. Uh, and then now they're working on the infrastructure bill. But that's, you know, that's a long term thing. We don't really see at the current time that money's going out into people's pockets like it was. Uh, over the, say the prior 18 months, uh, and so we're starting to see a deceleration in retail purchases. We're seeing a deceleration in some of these things, uh, and so after this kind of rent increase, you you could see potentially some leveling out of that inflation. And if you go back, if you go back and look at the 1940s, which is the, the the decade that I consider kind of the closest analog to this one, not a perfect analog, but but close in terms of fiscal monetary policy, you had kind of the same thing there. You had these periods of inflation spikes, then you had it, it, it kind of level off, then you had another spike and it level off. Part of that was from wage and price controls, but it's also partially just because things tend to not go up in a straight line. The same is true for the 70s, although it was more gradual, is you'd have these waves of higher and lower inflation. Uh, and so I think the 2020s are going to be the same thing, where there's going to be periods of inflation, and then you know, uh, you know, it cools off maybe because fiscal stimulus is slowed down, um, and then we go on to you know another you know slow down, and they do another round of fiscal stimulus, and they get another round of inflation. Uh, and so I think these things are going to be be rolling over time, and I think the longer that progresses, the more people start to realize that that maybe this is longer lasting than I thought. An example I like to use is that if you bought a five-year treasury a year ago. Inflation's already outpaced the five years of coupons. What's the impact of that that you foresee when this wakening up happens, if it does, that inflation is more persistent than perhaps they were led to believe, uh, or the or the devaluation of the dollar is more persistent than they're hoping it would be? Uh, how does that how does that affect uh, our financial lives? So a couple of ways. One is I think it's already playing out gradually in the sense that a lot of people are overweight equities because they instinctively would rather hold equities than bonds uh, if they perceive bonds as being devalued, uh, which I think is a correct view. The, the risk there is that they can build up equities to such a high valuation and such a large share of the economy. And then the big challenge comes, so if, you have, if you have, say, low energy prices, so you have commodity abundance, um, and you have functioning supply chains, uh, and you have a lot of money printing, then a lot of the inflation is going to go into asset prices and less so into consumer prices. That's what we saw over the past decade. Um, but now that we're in this environment of, of sloppier supply chains uh, causing issues uh, and some rising commodity and energy prices, uh, you know that's starting to cause consumer price inflation as well. And so that can actually squeeze the margins of, of certain businesses, uh, meaning that you know uh, they they could report kind of you know weaker quarterly results than say analysts expected. They could have margins being squeezed because they're say unable to raise their prices as quickly as some of their expenses are going up. It'll obviously vary by industry and 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 how you know some companies have more pricing power than others. Um, and so when that starts to play out, if that starts to play out, uh, then you get inflation without good equity performance. Um, and so that starts to cause issues. One is it causes issues for the tax base, right? Because uh, you know part of the, you know the large portion of the U.S. economy is financialized, and so uh, consumption is a big part of GDP, uh, and asset prices going up are a big part of consumption.
the wealth effect and everything. And so when 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 and when asset price when specifically equities and home prices stop going up, that can cause slowdowns in consumption, slowdowns in in, in federal tax revenue. And so that can actually result in a larger deficit. So from there, you'd be in a somewhat more stagflationary type of environment where it'd be better to hold, you know, commodities, things like that, you know, maybe maybe real assets that are actually benefiting from that inflation rather than having their margins harmed by it. Uh, and so the way that can turn out in our finances, if someone's overweight, if someone has like a 60-40 portfolio, that's where that can start to run into problems. So over the past, say, decade, the forty percent of bonds has already been been pretty poorly performing, but it was made up for the fact that that the Nasdaq and the S and P five hundred just went straight up, uh, pretty much with with these periodic dips that were you know resulted in in you know new money printing and get that back up. Uh, but if we start to get into a, a somewhat more persistently inflation environment uh, with you know more headwinds, and then especially if you start to see uh, you know regulators kind of reverse some of the tax cuts, right? So we've had, if you look at effective corporate tax rates uh, you know, over time, they've gone down for, for decades and decades straight. So there's the headline tax rate, but there's also the effective tax rate, which is which takes into account different ways of, you know, uh, loopholes they can do or different sort of things they can, they can do. And so that's gone down and down and down. And so that's helped stock prices as a percentage of GDP keep going up and up and up. And if that starts to level out or even reverse as as people are trying to find out the you know figure out the budget shortfalls and things like that, that can start putting downward pressure on on equity indices uh, at a time when bonds also aren't performing very well. Uh, and if you've if you've gotten to super low interest rates and everyone kind of piled into the housing market, then housing prices aren't going up anymore, and you start to get that stagnation. And that's when you start to it gets kind of messier. That's when you could see, for example, the foreign sector. Uh, uh, instead of kind of reinvest their dollars into the U.S. market, they could potentially go elsewhere and kind of start that spiral going in the other direction. And so if that's the kind of environment you want to have. There's different ways to protect against that.